Hello again. It's uh, Monday, just around lunchtime. I'm going to try to go through these uh, screenshots that I've collected just to use as notes for um, the video I want to make right now, which is just basically comments, feedback, and some sharing of information uh, with John McIntyre and, uh, of course, all those who are interested in this topic <clears throat> that he made his video about. Um, yeah, I had a great weekend. I went to the uh, Philadelphia Free Mind Fest, saw some great um, speakers, some fantastic music, and just an all-around uh, wonderful uh, time with a lot of good people. Um, so anyway, here we are. It's Monday. <laughs> Back to work. And uh, so anyway, I want to try to get through these slides and uh, and conclude and post this video today, hopefully. Um, I just, you know, I'm, I don't want to see it become an hour long video, so I'll, I may try to move quickly through this. Um, one thing I want to mention right away is that uh, I jumped into this arena early on without much of an understanding of <clears throat> the people I was actually talking to. And uh, I know I came off in ways that I, you know, would rather not have. Let me put it that way. I, wanna, I don't want to go into a big, long thing and try to keep this succinct. But um, I'm here with a whole different approach to this. It's really just to share uh, what I've, you know, seen all my life. I've been surveying a long time. And, uh, you know, I think I can show you some things that, uh, you know, not everyone is familiar with. And uh, that, that's all I'm going to try to do now. I like this video that, that John made. Um, it, it caught my eye right away. Here's a guy that, you know, went outside, went through a lot of effort. And, uh, you know, and I really appreciate it. And I, I made some comments over there to congratulate him on, on what he did. Um, it takes time. It takes effort. you got to plan these things. You've got to get to the location. Uh, you, you, all of you that watched his video, you see what he went through. You see, there he is, you know, cutting down branches and trying to trying to get a, a line of sight to where he could uh, make his observations. So, you know, a lot of uh, credit goes to John for all the work he put into planning this, uh, going out and executing it, and then, of course, uh, all the work that goes into making the video, which. You know, I don't have that skill. I'm basically using screenshots, and I'm going to talk over uh, the screenshots, uh, just using them as notes. And oh, so I'm going to do a little, maybe, hopefully, a, like a live demo of some software. So let me go ahead and start moving through this. Um, the first thing I'll make mention of is that, uh, rightly so, John gets a lot of great a commentary. I just made one screenshot here of the comments I made, but you know, if you if you look through there, you know, a lot of people love the video. So there's a lot of high praise. I caught this one here where John is, you know, letting everybody know he's not on one side or the other. He's just trying to pre present some evidence, and uh, so that's the point that I'll go next here to. Oh, by the way, if you'll, if you'll see up top here, these are my slide numbers, and then it's the minutes and seconds into the video. That's how I'm, I'm just going to go right through the video pretty much in order. And the first thing that I uh, screenshot here was the altimeter, which is a, you know, a piece of technology that I did notice that I didn't see anybody asking any questions about that. So I, I want to uh, just make a shot here that maybe we can discuss the, this technology um, in another video, what an altimeter is, how it functions, how it does what it does. That, I think it's important. And uh, all right, just wanted to make mention of that. Next is uh, my third slide at nine minutes in. Um, I did see some people make some comments about this particular sketch. Hey, we all make sketches. 
And by the way, I want to make sure that everyone understands I am not being critical in any way. I, 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 this is not this video is not meant to criticize or or, or um, anything like that. I want to I want to remain very positive. I think John would be open to any you know positive feedback. And <clears throat> you, you know this sketch is meant to illustrate something, but you gotta you gotta also take into consideration that it is um, you know that's like the entire North American continent. Um, almost a quarter of size of the globe. And of course, sight lines are not curved. So I uh, just wanted to make that point. But guess what? It, he recovers from this beautifully in the graphics that he does produce later. So, you know, no big deal. I just want to make mention of that. Uh, let's go on. The next thing I really want to uh, draw attention to are the elevations and the distances that are used throughout the video. The real question is, is where do we get those numbers? And uh, I've been asking people this for a while now. Do you, do you look at and find out and, um, you know, validate the source for the values of elevations and distances that you're using in your experiments? And again, this isn't directed at John particularly. This is like basically anybody out there doing experiments. Um, you know, let's let's look at the source data for where these values come from. Uh, I'll move on. That's the point of that slide. Now here, I love it. I mean, I don't know what uh, software John used here, but he does make mention that the curvature is accurate here in the drawing. And that's the beautiful thing of this particular section in the video is that you can clearly see that uh, it sure looks flat, doesn't it? And I think this is an important point for everyone to think about that, uh, you know, the scale of the earth, you know, when you walk around outside, uh, you know, you're not seeing curvature and there's a huge interest right now in everybody wanting to see the curvature. And, you know, obviously you just can't see it. Um, John makes, you know, kind of concludes in his video that he was not able to detect curvature. I'll just offer back that with a little bit more information and possibly uh, some additional skill set in your, in your toolkit when you go and do your next experiment, you may find that you're going to produce some evidence that is to the contrary of that, John. So, and that's the point of this video. I'm going to share some things with you that you can make use of on your next experiment, which I saw in the comments, you are planning to go and do something else. Um, hopefully this video is useful to you and you can take away from it some additional uh, tools and uh, resources to apply in your next experiments. And that goes for everybody, anybody that's um, interested in going outside and, and collecting data. You know, in this slide, um, and I, I, I'm not getting into the nitty gritty of your evaluation or your numbers presented, okay? I'm not uh, questioning any of those. But the first thing I notice on this slide is horizontal plane line of sight in red here. And I immediately think, well, how, how was that determined? Um, and I think that's what everyone needs to think about. How do you do that? Uh, it, it cannot possibly be done simply as a sightseer and going to certain locations and looking out over the horizon. I mean, you're just seeing the scenery, but you can't possibly adjust your eyeball in some way to establish a horizontal plane line of sight. That takes, that takes something else besides our eyes to do. Emails coming in, I hear. We can ignore that for now. Um, yeah, I'm on my lunch break. <laughs> so, uh, and, and again, Throughout this uh, presentation, throughout this uh, video, I should say, I will be discussing this and helping everyone to see the essential 
uh, requirements to establish this. It's very important that that is established, but how do you do it? So uh, that's something I want to get across in the in the here in this video. Okay, next here is about 24 minutes in. This statement's being made, and and John uses the word declination uh, several times, or you know here and there throughout the throughout his video. Just offering this back that I think by declination, he's thinking in terms of declining and came up with the word declination. But declination is actually a, a, a an actual term and it has to do with, uh, you know, it's an actual mapping term. And it's here, you could find it on any topographic map. The declination is the horizontal variation between magnetic north and astronomic north. That's that's what declination is, and it you know changes over time because the magnetic pole is definitely moving. Um, let me go back to this slide. See the other thing that I wanted to discuss. This is uh, something that John and others are still misunderstanding. To to think that you could literally walk someplace and look out over the horizon or look out over your vantage point toward the horizon and and make a determination of what you should or should not be able to see is really a misunderstanding. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to help people see that. Um, I'll do my best. That's all I can do. The point is, is that if you see something, you can see it. And no one can tell you, you should not be able to see it. Let's Let's just be real about it. Trust your eyes. If you see it, it's okay. You can see it. It's out there. You could also think about the things you cannot see. Okay, if I'm up in the Appalachian Mountains and I'm looking westward, uh, I can definitely not see the Rocky Mountains. Okay, that's that's a given. And no one would expect that you should be able to see the Rocky Mountains, even though they're much taller. You're not going to be able to see them, but as you travel around up in any mountain range and you go to any vantage point on any hill or summit, you're going to have a fantastic view and you're going to see a lot of things. But there's a lot of things you cannot see. So when you see something, don't have it in your mind that you should not be able to see that. That, that kind of doesn't make sense. So, again, I hope I am not coming across critical. Uh, I'm not intending to be, I'm just trying to make a point and, uh, and you know, maybe try to move this whole discussion a, a, a little bit further along to where we all have a better understanding of how to uh, compute curvature, compute the expectation of what you should or should not be able to see and, and all this. That's what I'm trying to get across. So I'll, I'll move on. Before you know it, this will be a two-hour video. All right, I already talked about the declination. Uh, the next thing we come to, uh, or that I'm pointing out and uh, grabbed a screenshot of, is the uh, this hidden hidden calculator, and it's uh, from um, uh, Mike Mick West of Metabunk. And um, I noticed the word bulge here, the bulge height, and the hidden amount. And I, I have to say, you know, I'm not familiar with this. I don't. I don't know about these terms used this way. So, um, but I did go and look at um, his site and I looked at the calculator and I saw this sketch. And, you know, I wanted to kind of investigate the math being used. And, and if I understand it right, and I, I could be wrong, somebody you know can correct me. I believe that what's purely being used here is the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, and I don't think there's much more to what is being uh, made use of here. Here's the bulge. I, so, you know, I'm looking at the sketch and I realize, oh, so this is what they mean by the bulge height. And I have to say what what it looks like to me. And I, you know, I, I as a surveyor, I'm familiar with this geometry. And it honestly just kind of looks like a horizontal curve that we use in, you know, laying out roads or a curb, you know, uh, 
it's 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 the m is the uh, middle ordinate and you can compute what that is uh, from the chord to the curve of course uh this is a horizontal curve so we're just we're looking at it up in the um upward position but you would you would lay this down and that would be a horizontal curve and it's that's the geometry of a horizontal curve okay I'll, I'll move on i just wanted to share with you you know my own growth in this and trying to understand what people are doing um here at this point in the in the in john's video he talks about uh computing this hidden aspect and uh it isn't hidden, okay? If you can see it, it isn't hidden. But what you can compute is the drop of the curve from the horizontal plane. And that's the kind of thing I want to hopefully make real clear in this video. Now, here's a video everybody can go and look at. I, I think uh, Dr. Zach did a fine job, and he did it in two parts. He has a part one and a part two about the curvature math. And I, I just grabbed this screenshot where he makes it very clear that the, the distance that we're talking about is this distance. It's going to be this piece of distance that is calculated as the drop from what? From this. This is the horizontal. Now the question becomes is how do you establish that horizontal plane? Let's all look at this a little bit and think about it. Wherever you're doing your experiment, wherever you're doing your observations, recording your videos, or whatever you're doing, you cannot establish this plane by just looking out over the horizon. That's not possible. Okay. You don't have the graduated eyeball to be able to say, I am looking exactly at 90 degrees. Because if you look out, at a mountain or a building or whatever, you don't know, how can you know without, you know, how can you use your eyes and say, okay, the top of that building is, is the horizontal plane. Oh no, it's not the top of the building. It's like midway down. That's the horizontal plane. Or no, 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 it's actually the bottom of the building. You, you can't possibly judge with your eyeball alone to say the horizontal plane is at X position out there uh, where I'm looking. Anyway, back to Zach's videos. Great. Uh, awesome. I love this. So he got my thumbs up. I love that. And uh, that's the point I just want to make there. Let me, let me try to keep this video short. Now, here's where I'm going to talk about obscured or <clears throat> hidden, uh, that aspect, that whole idea of, hey, we shouldn't be able to see that. It's not so much we shouldn't be able to see it. It's basically we cannot see it. You can't, you can't see it. And when you start to investigate uh, an area to do an experiment, and if you want to talk about um, planning for where you need to be to see what, you have to involve elevations. You know, these, these graphs or these diagrams are, are basically just assuming what people are saying is sea level or is the theoretical surface of the earth. And we're all using a sphere, which is cool. You know, uh, we could use a sphere for approximating these discussions, which is fine. But when you want to start talking about um, hidden, hidden views, things hidden from your view, you have to then consider the elevation, you know, at your point, at the point that you're looking at, and also anything in between. Now, the mathematics for that are a little bit more involved, all right? It's not just eight inches times the mile squared. That isn't it. You're, you're really trying to calculate the line of sight uh, uh, for intervisibility between two points. You've got to involve the elevations of the two points and intervening terrain along the line. Um, hopefully that's clear. Move on. So where do you go for that math? Because uh, I, I figured I'd share this book with you, with everyone. 
you know, everyone's pretty much familiar with the eight inches times the miles squared formula for calculating the drop of the curve. But I do think most people are misapplying that and they're, 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 they're thinking that that calculates uh, the missing aspect over the horizon and that's not what it does. But again, if you want to calculate and you want to do an investigation of, uh, of uh, intervisibility between points out on the terrain, you got to go to this book. book. Well, this is one source anyway. It's called the Manual of Reconnaissance for Triangulation. In the course of this video, I'm going to talk heavily about triangulation. Well, this is even before you do the triangulation, you got to go out and do a recon mission to figure out where are you going to place your points? Where, where should you... Where's the best vantage point? How are you going to see from one place to another? This book is all about that. And it's a huge effort that, that was undertaken by survey parties long ago. They had to do it uh, to maximize their uh, ability to see, you know, from one point to another. So the math is in this book. I'll just show you a couple of diagrams from it. You know, this is, this is all about how am I going to go from here to here? with this in between, uh, et cetera. Uh, oh, by the way, you can download that book, so I'm going to just move on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but just wanted to draw your attention to it. Here's a diagram from the book, a little plotting called Typical Reconnaissance Problem, which the idea with triangulation is that you want to measure angles between and, and, and to the features out on the horizon, whether it's buildings, mountaintops, et cetera. And, well, you know, if I can see them from this point, am I also going to see them from this point? Well, all of that had to be figured out before they went through the effort of monumenting these with, uh, with disks. And that's what they did. They literally chose the places they wanted to do the observations from and uh, during the recon mission, during the reconnaissance. And then they set the disks and then they went out and did the triangulation. Um, here's a section in the book discussing the effect of curvature at an intermediate obstruction. So there's there's definitely more math involved here. And if, uh, Mick, if you weren't aware of this book, um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to send a link to you, to it for you. And, you know, you might, you know, you might come up with another spreadsheet or another uh, curve calculator that uh, takes advantage of this aspect of calculating the intervisibility between two points in, you know, when you know the elevations of the two points and any intervening obstructions or, or, or terrain along the way. All right, so moving on. Uh, the next piece that I'll, I'll jump into is where John, you know, shows the topographic maps that he's using, which is excellent. I mean, this is the way to go. Uh, this is a great tool. Um, and the question then is, again, where do we get the information? Where, where do these values come from, these heights and distances? How did that come about? Uh, it just, you know, it just didn't, it had to be done by somebody, right? And it had to be done in some way. Well, what is that way? How was this done? Let's, um, let's consider that. Well, I went and uh, looked up the old topographic maps from the 1800s because that's when most of this work literally took place. And um, here you could see, you know, uh, this is the corner of, a, of the Asheville quadrangle from back in the 1800s. Naming the people who were in charge, the triangulation was performed by, I think it's W.C. Kerr and S.S. Gannett. And the topography was by W.L. Miller. And here's the survey data, 1898 to 99, for this particular quadrangle, uh, topographic uh, quadrangle map. These are seven and a half minute by seven and a half minute quadrangles. Uh, that's the bounds of each of these maps. Well, this is my cue to go ahead and show you that map. I went and downloaded this. Uh, and actually, I went and downloaded all, all the maps surrounding it. So there's that note. It's pretty cool here. It says here they were 25 cents a piece. 
Uh, and back in the day when we had to buy uh, topographic maps, they weren't 25 cents. They were they started to get up there, I don't know, three or four bucks. And now we can just download them for free. Now, the, the cool thing about these, of course, you can see each adjoining quadrangle, like off in this corner, you'll see that one. Here, you'll see the adjoining map is Pisgah and, and so on. And uh, here you could see the top corner. Uh, let's see what else I could show you. Just the name of this quadrangle. And, you know. Oh, here's the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, engraved February 1901 by USGS. That's the U.S. Geological Survey. These are actually sc scratched or engraved onto a medium. I, I, I don't know all the details of how they made these, but th it's all hand-drawn. And uh, you know, a lot of work went into making these maps. A lot of work went into doing the survey work to... <laughs> get all of these uh, these locations and plot them, you know, in the right relationship to one another, railroads, rivers, roadways, you know, lakes, streams, everything, all right? So I'm going to close that. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to share at that point. Moving on, I, um, I'll make mention of this um, little video I made uh, just recently, how to georeference maps to bring into AutoCAD or GIS software or surveying software. You can go watch that little video. And it's, you know, it's all about taking a map like the one I just showed you, which is a paper scanned map, scanned to an image file, a PDF or a, um, a TIFF or JPEG, and how you can literally put the coordinates onto the map and make use of it in your software. So it's a very useful thing to do, especially when you want to go plan and experiment or do some testing somewhere and collect data. It's good to you know, get all the information collected together in one software and, and decide what you're going to do. And you'll also learn a lot. Like you'll, you'll learn about things that you didn't know were there when you look at some of these older maps. And so there's that. Moving on, the other thing I wanted to show you was that when they went out and did the survey work, they literally wrote reports. And they reported all of their triangulation and their uh, spirit leveling. Spirit leveling isn't a religious term. <laughs> it's, it means uh, the level vial in the, in the in level instrument. That's an alcohol solution in that level vial, that tube of glass. And they call that a spirit level. Uh, I guess that differentiated it from some other kind of level. I don't know, but uh, it's funny. So we don't really use spirit level anymore. We say leveling or digital leveling because nowadays our leveling instruments are, uh, it's a digital instrument. And uh, anyway, moving on. So anyway, but look, this is from 1899. I, you know, there's, you can get all the volumes every year. One of these was uh, out, you know, uh, was published. It reports all of the activities of all the survey parties, uh, you know, through the year and what they were doing and what their plans were for the following year, etc. Now here, I'm going to show you this. Uh, this is a map plotting the triangulation that was observed in this Asheville area where, where John's uh, video takes place. And uh, what you see on here are the long lines that, that they observed. And of course, like I said earlier, when I was talking about the reconnaissance, it took a lot of recon to go and find where the best vantage points were to go and, and, and see as far as you could see, determine what could you see, and then set, set these marks, which I'm gonna show you some of the marks in, in, later in this video. Uh, the other thing you're gonna see here on this diagram are the level routes. This is all the leveling that was done. So you'll notice they stay along the rivers. They'll stay along railroad tracks. They're going to stay along any linear feature that they can uh, set their level up and, and read the rod and move on and move on. And I'll show you what that is. 
So you've got two different survey efforts going on here. You've got level parties and doing all the leveling to, to get the elevations. And then they would run, not every one of these, by the way, but every once in a while, they would run some leveling up a mountain. That's not an easy thing to do. But they would have to do it and get some a leveled vertical value uh, elevation from sea level. I'm going to just say it that way simply onto a mark. And then it was by trigonometry that they would uh, transfer the elevations to the other marks. Like, I don't think anyone ran levels up to this mountain or or this mountain. I mean, they may have, I, I just don't see it there. But like I'm saying, all these triangulation stations um, were observed simply by angles only, you know, horizontal angles and vertical angles. Right, let me move on. Before you know it, this will be a three hour video. I, I could talk about this stuff on and on. So here's a diagram of leveling, just so you understand. You put the rod on a benchmark, the level creates a, a horizontal plane. And you read the rod here, that's your back sight. And you read the rod here, that's your foresight. So basically benchmark one, if this was elevation one and you, you add 1.50 and then you subtract one and, and on and on, if I read that right, let's see. So it's a stepwise process. So you're going up the mountain up this way and to come up with the elevation here. And then of course you'd have to run it back. You have to run back to close because the sum of all your back sites and foresights has to zero out. You can't leave that open because if you make a mistake at any one point along the way, you're going to get a, the wrong reading here. So leveling is a, a, it's a loop. You're running a loop. Basically you've got to go, to a mark, and then back to where you started. And then the process begins again. Now you can start from here and run up the mountain and back down the mountain. So it's a lot of work. Uh, so that's leveling. Now for triangulation, I found a really nice video uh, and I, I shared it here and I definitely credit that guy for his video. But I do make a note, he, he recorded it so low and I didn't know how to crank up the volume, so you're going to have to crank up the volume or put on headphones. But it's a really good video to watch talking about triangulation in the early days, how it was done. This happens to be in Europe, um, but it's the same here. All right, that's there for, your, for you to go look at. Here's basically some surveyors doing the, the early triangulation. They would literally build towers you know, from tree branches and stuff, cut some trees, make a platform. And you have two things here. You have an instrument stand for the instrument and then a stand for the observers to walk around. And then here's a target so that the instrument maybe way over here on this mountain, you know, can see that as well. So they're observing each other from one mountain to another. And here's a rickety old thing they built. <laughs> <clears throat> so they were really trying to get up high to be able to see further. Uh, let's move on. Here's a couple of surveyors with a you know pretty gigantic uh, theodolite. You, you know, this type of surveying is not your everyday type of surveying. You know, this is specialized uh, geodetic surveying. It's not um, the type of surveying done for you know laying out a shopping mall or doing some road work or something like that. So the, the, you know, this is, uh, it's just a whole different thing. You're talking about very, very long, long sight lines. Oftentimes the observations are done at night. Um, and that means that the target you're looking at is illuminated. Um, so again, here they are building another tower out of wood. So this is probably like eight, uh, early, uh, or I'm sorry, eight late, 1800s is what you're looking at here. Moving on. So you're getting into a little bit more modern times. And here's an example of a target with the with lights for night observing. And it's set up over the disc or the mark. 
Also, what I don't have a picture of it, but there's a thing called a heliotrope, which is uh, designed to capture the sunlight and reflect it back in any direction. So you could literally direct the sunlight toward uh, the instrument uh, way off on some other you know, vantage point, and then they could see a bright, a bright uh, light that they could sight on. Now we're get, getting into later times where <clears throat> instead of cutting down a lot of trees to make the tower, these are um, these are called Bilby steel towers, and they would erect them from uh, steel steel uh, construction. So these could be put up and then taken down. So as you're planning the triangulation, you've got a whole party of construction uh, tower constructors going ahead and putting the towers up, assuring that they're over the mark. And here's an example of the uh, target. Okay, so he's on top of this tower, aiming these lights toward uh, the observer, could be 10, 20, 30 miles away. And uh, so that's a Bilby steel tower, which I did reshare a video I found of someone that put up some old films of I think it's in four parts of these guys uh, constructing Bilby Towers. Okay, back to the video. The next uh, screenshot I took was where John shows us this thing called Peak Finder, which is really cool. I had no idea there was such a thing. This is a nice website to go check out. And you can, you can almost do a lot of recon before you even... Um, leave your house. So this is pretty cool. Um, now, the thing about it is, let's, let's keep in mind, we want to know well, where did this data come from? Where is the digital elevation model from to produce those graphics? It's listed here. Um, so a lot of this stuff is very old triangulation topography, but over time it's been um, refined and improved using uh, more modern technology, aerial photogrammetry is one over the years. And then, of course, there's something called remote sensing, which is using uh, laser technology. It's called LIDAR. And, uh, and some of these are actually, you know, they're all from airborne, app, uh, airborne platforms, whether it's airplanes or high-flying jets or even, uh, dare I say, satellites. <clears throat> so... And by the way, that data is available. It is not in someone's, uh, you know, secret vault. You can research and go get this data. You can bring it into your own software and do your own analysis of that data and use it in your in your work. Next screenshot. Um, John makes the point that the elevations are varying, and I get what he means. Uh, you know, you could look on one map, and the mountain peak is, uh, you know. 1,552, maybe on another uh, source, it says 1,575. Uh, it depends on, you know, what date the stuff was acquired, what technology was used. Um, you know, so each, each data set, you, you've got to look at what's called the metadata to find out how it was collected, how it was processed. Um, so you may find variations in... Uh, in the numbers themselves. But then, you, you know, you do have to decide, well, what what variation can I tolerate in, in, uh, in this work that I'm performing? Now, I would encourage anybody to, before you do an experiment, before you go out as part of your research, to go ahead and find the geodetic markers that are available to you. In other words, uh, someone's already been there before you, and a lot of this work is already done for you. So um, if you didn't know about it, now you do. And I made a little video about this, collecting and researching and finding the geodetic control. So you can go look at that. And, you know, they left their mark, as they say. They, uh, we follow in their footsteps. You know, they, they put these discs, uh, they're in rock, they're in concrete, they're, uh, you know, they're permanently attached 
A lot of them get destroyed over time from by construction or, or vandals, people just yanking them out to collect them as a souvenir, which is, you know, a bummer. But so th this is a way of, uh, you know, at least starting from a point that you could uh, rely upon for the value and uh, maybe dispense with some of the, uh, the, the variations you're finding. It's, uh, that's it. I'll just make that point. Go get your geodetic control. All right, this is my cue to go ahead and um, show you the, the software that I'm working in. And uh, also, this would be a follow-up to the, the other video I made where I, I geo-referenced the maps, because now all the maps are in here. Also, all of the uh, geodetic control that I was interested in is also in here. And if you go look at that video, I show you how I research it, find it, save it to a text file. You know, that's, that's that mark right there. Uh, there's an azimuth mark up on that mountain. This point here called fry pan is, is my determination of what I looked at in Google Earth, and I said, eh, it must be right about here. And I clicked a spot and grabbed the elevation, and, you know, I created my own uh, peak for fry pan. There used to be a station up here, too, which is no longer here. And this was the azimuth mark to it. So that's, I think, still there. And, uh, you know, that's how they could get a direction or a bearing from the triangulation station to the uh, azimuth mark. And, uh, you know, as you start researching geodetic control, you're going to find out there's a lot of different kinds of disks out there for, uh, you know, for different purposes. All right. So I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I just wanted to show you how I can display this one. There we go. And turn them on. These are the, uh, the old 1800 uh, series, like from the 1880s, 1890s, the, those uh, topographic maps. There we go. One more, come on, there we go. And, and you know, again, these, these are just uh, paper maps scanned to an image file, and I went ahead and geo-referenced them. I had to geo-reference them on an older datum and then convert or transform them to the current datum, which is why there's they're kind of uh, overlapping each other here. But nevertheless, you can you can uh, use these as background images and and do some investigating, some calculating. Uh, you know, it's useful, very useful. So I'll turn those back off. Show you another map that I brought in. Toggle that, and show you this map. This is the map I, I showed you just a little bit ago, you know, as a screenshot. Again, this is the, this is that map uh, geo-referenced and brought in, and uh, you know, I made the point that, you know, everywhere you go is coordinated now. So this is projected in the uh, North Carolina State Plane Coordinate System in U.S. Survey Feet. Turn that back off. And the other one I'll show you. Actually, you know what? We'll leave that on for a second. I'll show you what, what's going on here. This is just a small section of the state. It's just basically a one degree by two degree um, portion of the state. I'll turn this guy on. And now if I show, if I highlight that, there we go, I'll bring forward. So now if I zoom out, here's the entire state of North Carolina 
and this is the triangulation diagram for the whole state and uh, it's been geo-referenced so it's coordinately accurate you can see see our points here so this is that this is uh, John's experiment area uh, in his video uh, Here's the peaks that I picked. Select. Here's the peaks as I picked them out of uh, Google Earth. There's Miska. So here's Mount Tennant. Fry pan. And Greybeard, which uh, I don't know if I made mention of this in the earlier uh, one of my earlier videos. I, I noticed sometimes you'll see it spelled G R E Y. Uh, I think I've covered everything I want to talk about in here. I, I'm not going to sit here and go through a lot. You can do a lot of calculations in this software. Uh, I'll just show you the results of that. I'm going to close that save it and now we're back to the my little screenshots moving on here's the results i came up with just for just looking from tenant to fry pan tenant to mount Ms. pisca and tenant to graybeard and um, i don't have i didn't memorize what values you were using John, and uh, so I'm not trying to say my v number. That I'm not trying to tell you fry pan is 5,325 feet tall. I'm not. That's just where I picked in Google Earth. So, you know, these, these could vary from your numbers, etc. The main point of this is just to show you an analysis I did. So from here to here drops 383 feet in elevation. Uh, seems to me that if, if I picked in the right spot, it looks like Mount Pisgah is four feet higher than Tenet. Yeah. Basically, you know, where I picked, but I could have picked in the wrong spot. I don't know. I'm not that good in Google Earth. So anyway, just playing around in Google Earth, grabbed some points, and then calculated the delta arc, which is the difference between this vertical reference and that vertical reference. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, let's see, I'm also showing the mileage between them. And I also calculated the drop from the horizontal plane at Tenet. So we established the horizontal plane here. And I've already made the point that if you're up here looking out here, you cannot do that with your eye. You need, you need equipment. You got to be able to make this reference somehow, some way. Your eyeball can't do it. If anyone out there thinks they can, I'd love to see how you do it. <laughs> so that's, you know, I, I'm hoping this diagram helps people get, get a full understanding now that we got to move away from old school flat earth, incorrect usage of eight inches times the mile squared. Abandon that, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm not abandon the formula. I mean, just abandon thinking it calculates you know, the hidden thing over the horizon. It, it doesn't. It calculates this drop. So that's it. Uh, and, there's, and there's your visual line of sight. You could see from here to here, but uh, in order to use the eight inches times the mile squared approximation, you know, we're looking at this. That's it. I, I think that's it. I just wanted to make that point. That's the big point. Moving on. Um, well, here's an example of someone who went out and observed a very long line with a surveying instrument and, you know, using the same methods and same approach that was used to create all those topographic maps, all those surveyors from long ago, using that same methodology 
he records this video and he shows all of his calculations. And I'm really impressed with this work. It's, it's, um, it's very helpful. Uh, it only got 107 views. I, I just, this is the thing that like really boggles my mind is that there's such an interest in is the earth curved or flat? But I think everyone's focused on other things like NASA photography, you know, fake photos and, and all of these different uh, distractions, really. Why don't we all concentrate on can we actually measure the curvature? And, you know, that's what I'm trying to bring the conversation back to. Um, so he did a great job here, and I, I just wanted to include that in my video. Uh, so here, here's some theodolites. Here's a electronic total station. So these are manual. It's, a lot of people call this a transit to diff, distinct. So it is a theodolite, okay, but it, it has gotten the name transit. This is a definitely a theodolite. And here's one that's digital. These are manual reading. You look in there, there's no electronics. You point, you observe, you read, read and write. And this one here has a digital output. In fact, you can hook up a data collector to these and actually record the information digitally. And that's how we survey today. If, if you can go out and use one of these, great. If you know someone that has one of these, bring them along for your experiments. If you're intimidated by this type of a equipment, then, you know, I'm going to say, go ahead and use one of these. This is going to do something very simple for you. You're not going to measure angles. You're not going to measure horizontal angles, and you're not going to measure vertical angles or zenith angles. You're going to just literally set it up, look through the scope, and there will be a horizontal crosshair out there, and that is your level plane at your location extended out to the to the scene. And th they're real simple. You can get them, you can probably rent these from a A to Z rental center. Uh, I happened to just buy one the other day at a yard sale. The guy had a brand new one. <laughs> I got the tripod, the level, and the rod and a couple other things for less than 200 bucks. So, you know, you can, I, I saw someone post, they found one of these on, uh, on uh, Craigslist. So if you really like doing this stuff, I would say go buy one of these or, or at least go rent one to go do your experiment or bring a friend along who has one. And uh, I think your eyes are gonna be opened when you set this up and look through it. And it's so simple. It just has a bullseye level. If you get that bubble into the red circle, the internal compensator will level this up to a very high degree of precision. It isn't perfect. You know, it's a, some of these are just called a builder's grade level. So I'm not trying to tell you that it is an absolute perfect line of sight. It's, 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 every instrument has error associated with it. The question is, are we talking inches or feet? or hundreds of feet of error, you know, obviously this thing has some tolerance associated with it, but I think for the purpose of conversation here, when we're looking out 30 miles away, you know, we're not talking about inches. We're not talking about a couple of feet. You're, you're really talking about hundreds of feet. And this instrument here is certainly adequate to give you the right picture. So you could see what is going on. I'll, I'll leave it that way for you. Um, anyway, there we go. Moving on. This is my level. It was set up on uh, Apple Pie Hill. And I've made mention of this before. I'll just say it here. What got my interest in, in doing this was um, watching a video called Flat Earth Proof 3 Land Ho. And that video sh you know, shows a lot of places around the world using this curvature mathematics to say that these are hidden or that there's missing curvature, et cetera. And Apple Pie Hill, looking at Philadelphia is one of the examples and I, and I live close to there. So I went up and looked and you know, that's what I saw. And um, 
So I took that picture that's through my level and there's and that horizontal line, this horizontal line is the level plane, the horizontal plane extended from Apple Pie Hill out to Philadelphia. So it's 35 miles away. Uh, I'm at an ele the, the, this this crosshair is at elevation 256. And that building right there is the Comcast building. And it's at, this is elevation 1,006 feet at the top. I measured it myself. So I'm about 140 feet down, about 138 feet slicing through the top of that building. Oh, I know what I wanted to talk about. I, I did leave off one thing about these instruments. The other point to make is these telescopes aren't aren't hugely powerful. They can't possibly compete with the videos that people are recording using these tremendous zoom telescopes looking really, really far. That's not the point to this. You know, the point is just to create this uh, for you. And, and again, it's just a visual. <sighs> what else can I say? I'll, I'll, I should, I'm, I'm probably going to make another video about this, this whole thing about perspective. I hear a lot of talk about perspective. And uh, they try to say perspective has something to do with this. I'll tell you this. Perspective makes things look small at a distance, right? We all know that this is a skyscraper. It's a giant skyscraper. If you go over here and stand and look up at it, it's gigantic. 35 miles away, it looks really small. So that's all perspective does. Perspective does not change the size of an object. You know, I, I had seen uh, someone made a video using a hallway example and, you know, how the hallway down at the other end looks smaller. And if someone walks down there to the other end of the hallway, they look smaller. Okay, they look smaller. They aren't smaller. So let's keep in mind that things do not change size just because they're further away. Um, yeah, right? That makes sense, right? So if you walk down to the other end of the hallway and you have a tape measure with you, you're going to notice that your friend is still the same size he was when, when he walked away from you down the hallway. He didn't shrink. And if you pull the tape measure out and measure the, the height and width of the hallway, it's the same as the other end of the hallway. So sizes don't change due to perspective. But uh, actually, that's it. I'm going to say that. Uh, what I want to do next is show you my blog. I just started this and uh, I figured I would start collecting my observations in a place where, you know, people can come, take a look. Um, which one's here? Lighthouses. So I thought I had, yeah, this is, uh, this is Fire, Fire Island. Uh, also, yeah, here's the Delaware Bay lighthouses. You could come and see where I was on the Delaware shore at twilight, looking at lighthouses. Before it got dark, I was able to take some pictures of these lighthouses. And what I show you here is um, a website for each lighthouse. So you have a close-up picture of of the lighthouse. And I also show you the NGS data sheet for each of these. Why? Because they are all positioned by triangulation way back in the day. So this is the Miamal Shoal light. So we know where it is. And for the elevation of it, or the height of it, which I make mention of, the nautical chart that I have that I geo-referenced as well and put in my software. This, uh, these nautical charts show you the heights of these lighthouses above uh, mean high water. So 
a lot of good information there. So let me shut that down. I think I'm getting to the conclusion of my video. I can't wait to go back to this location because I'm pretty sure I can see this Loran Tower. It's about 641 feet tall. And when I was over there at uh, on the Delaware side, way over here, and I turned these angles, I was trying to see the Cape May Lighthouse, and I couldn't see it. But I definitely saw lights blinking, but it was very hazy. So I need to go back in the in a clearer, uh, crisper fall air and try to see that thing. I think I'm done with that. And... What is next? Yeah, okay, that was my cue to show you my blog. Well, I showed it to you. Uh, I'm going to bring it back to this. Uh, let's leave it here. And I think this is worth discussing among all of us. And uh, I would love to, uh, to talk more about this with anyone that's interested. This horizontal plane line of sight, how do you do it? I think I've shown you how we do it, okay, and how anyone can do it. It's worth doing. And this is my cue to uh, splice in a little video clip. Lights basically consist of a series of mutually perpendicular axes. The vertical axis, which passes through the center of the horizontal circle. The trunnion axis, which passes through the center of the vertical circle. And the line of collimation, or line of sight, which passes along the center of the telescope through the center of the crosshairs on the diaphragm. Before it can be used to measure angles, the theodolite must be carefully centered and leveled so that its vertical axis passes vertically through the station, its horizontal circle lies in a horizontal plane, and its vertical circle lies in a vertical plane. And this is going to be the conclusion of the video. I just want to close with a few remarks, just saying that, uh, again, I appreciate all the work you put into your video, John, and and others that are out there doing experiments. You know, there there's not many out there, I don't think, going through the efforts of uh, literally planning an experiment, going out and, and conducting it. You know, there's definitely a lot of videos, but not many that show this type of work. And I hope that this video you find useful, and I hope that um, others who are interested in doing experiments can take away some of the uh, information I've shared here and the other videos that I'm making, um, you know, to use in your own experiments. And I look forward to speaking with anybody who, um, who likes doing this. You know, just send me a, a private message. I, um, and, you know, and we'll trade emails. I've, I've turned off my comments because I just, again, I don't have the, a lot of time to do this. And I really got behind in answering comments. And when I would come back and look, there'd be, uh, you know, just a disaster of things that I don't want on my channel. So, <clears throat> you know, you can go to other channels for that sort of thing. Oh, you know what? That, that's the other thing I wanted to, I wanted to make mention of this, that what you say right here, John, you have zero tolerance for all that drama and everything. I'm the same as you, which is why my comments are now turned off. And I want to do this person to person. That's how I want to be from now on is uh, rather than just throwing things up on YouTube, uh, I would love to connect with people. And um, I noticed there's a lot of these chat sessions or these live hangouts and things like that. Um, I'd even be interested in, in doing that if, if someone was, uh, you know, interested in having me on there to talk about some of this work. So um, pretty much I think that wraps it up. Looks like this video did not stay under an hour. <laughs> I couldn't manage it. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to finish this video and uh, just leaving it here that you have a mountain of evidence here, John. You are saying it's a compelling proof of a flat Earth. I'm hoping that what I've shown you in my video helps you see that can't possibly be the case. 
Um, that's not me being biased. That's just me reporting what I find and what I'm seeing. So uh, I, I don't know if you and I are on opposite sides of the fence. Uh, you do say in your comments you're not convinced one way or the other. Um, you've left it open. Maybe the, your next video will show otherwise. So uh, anyway, I, uh, I'll leave it here and uh, we'll see you on YouTube another time in another place, another video. All right. Take care, everybody. Danger.